Hey, what's up, everybody? This is a very special episode of Weirdos at Home. My name is Sam Slade, but you already know that. Today is Friday, which means I am in a very good mood. And I have a guest, a very special guest. Uh, I've been wanting to get him on to talk to him for a while now. He's a former state representative. Uh, one of the one of the Democratic, I, I would say, uh, uh, I mean, just yellow dogs, always bringing the good fight. Pancho Navarez is here. Thanks so much for having me on, man. Hey, Sam. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, man. Uh, did I botch the intro already? No, nah, man, that was good. <laughs> uh, uh, we were just talking about Bruce McGill, and I, I just wanted to tell you, so I walk up to him, and he takes, he literally looks me up and down, and he goes, let me guess, you want to know about Animal House? And I was like, oh, <laughs> is that obvious? I'm all fat and dumb? <laughs> Not, not not yet i don't but we'll get to it <laughs> uh no, no, that's good, good man we're, we're, uh, uh you know talking about your acting gigs right before we got on i mean i'm i'm following your acting career uh avidly man keeping up with you man that's pretty good stuff i'm just a, a another washed up political operative trying to get into hollywood just like uh <laughs> me, me and old ronnie reagan over here there's a there's a good niche for that, right? Like that. I don't I don't think that that's um that's out of the question. You know, so I can't remember who said there's no second acts in America. I don't believe that. Right. I can't remember. It's a great quote. I wish I could remember who said it. Um, how are you, man? What's been going on? You're down in uh, in Eagle Pass, right? I'm in Eagle Pass today. You know, I I um, you know, it's the end. I I for a long time I marked my life um in semesters because I was a student, right? And then uh, I went through a period where I was out of school and I didn't have kids and and I, the, all those lines blurry, you know, it's just one thing after another. And then I started having kids and you start marking time in semesters. And then I was in the legislature and I'd mark time by the interims and the sessions. And now I'm um, marking time again by semesters. And, <laughs> and by breaks, gaps in semesters to when I can record music and tour and things like that. But uh we just got finished with the school year. And so then it was spring football, softball, a graduation, um, you know, just kind of doing a little bit of everything, practicing law. But, you know, now and for the last like maybe couple of weeks, I've been going into the studio every day, working on uh, finishing a record that I started um, beginning of, of this year, tail end of last year, and then laying down basic tracks for like another 20 something songs that. I'm going to break up over two, two different records. And so that's kind of, and the other thing I've been trying to do is get myself on the road so I can play my music live. And it's, uh, you know, the business of all that is difficult and, you know, I've got, I've got some help, but I need more because I just don't understand it. And I, I always thought I was somewhat sophisticated for certain things, but in this, I am not sophisticated at all. I, um, I, I totally, I feel you. Uh, getting back out there doing standup, I, I can relate to those feelings. Uh, so you, you go, I, know, I know I can bring it, but how do we get to the place to bring it? Bring it, yeah. And so it's, I, the, well, what I do instead of bemoaning lack of opportunities or, you know, wishing that it could be a certain way. I just work at my craft, right? Um, because it does two things for me is it keeps me busy and keeps me going forward and keeps me creative. And it's it prepares me, right? It prepares me for the moment that I can start doing it on a more regular basis. And so I'll just keep working on, you know, playing and singing and, and in particular writing um, because I like it. And I think I'm, I'm reaching a level of, a proficiency at it that you know I never I didn't think I could but I can feel it now so uh you know we the last the first I say the last the first record that we did uh you know we've been able to sell it pretty well when we play live and we push some units here and there and and it's been satisfying because when people listen to it they tend to like it and I'm always kind of amazed at when you look at the results of where the music's getting listened to or heard uh where it goes you know now because of the digital space, your, your music, if you know how to do it, it can travel uh, far distances. And I'm working on how to be more proactive in getting that done. But, you know, we printed out uh, vinyl. We made vinyl copies of it, which, you know, I, oh, so I grew cool. up listening to records. That's I, so I cool, have, man. Yeah, I have an extensive record collection. So if I didn't do it that way to me, you know, when I say 
you know, I was making a record. I was literally making a record because I had to make a record and that's what I do. Right. It's not just digital, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so much cooler. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing, man, is uh, watching softball games, football practices. And I got to tell you, it's it, just from social media, it seems like your boy is playing football damn near year round. Yeah. You know what? It's, it's, yeah, the way that's set up and he's going to get a break in the fall because there's no fall season now until he gets into the high school, which is good. I think his body needs it, but it, I, I need it too. as a, as a yeah. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, he, he likes a lot of different things and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that he likes school too, because, you know, aside from playing sports, he's good at that. And Well, and you were, and you were the first member of your family to graduate from college. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, and, and it probably shouldn't have been that way, but I was, cause there's a lot of smart people, smarter people than me and, in, in, in my family and it, everybody, after I did it, everybody just kind of fell in line and did it too. And I, because I was the catalyst, but I think it was more like, well, if this dumb, dumb can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it too. Uh, but, uh, you know, I admire your shirt because, you know, I went to Texas and I'm, I'm still no, no, I, wore, I wore this for you today, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, as, as if a, I had known, I would have busted out my Texas gear too. I was, I was, I'm the biggest Longhorn fan that, that never, that never went to college. So, uh, <laughs> you know what, those, those are honestly, those are probably the best fans because they so love the university and the teams. And so it's all good, man. I mean, growing up in Austin, as a, you know, when it was still like late eighties, early nineties, sleepy college town, it was a given you were going to go to UT, you know, you know what? I, I, uh, I was in Austin on Tuesday and I'll probably go back next, not probably I'm going back next Friday, but as a precursor to some meetings I have in Nashville in a couple of weeks. And, and I'm always amazed at how much it's changed, uh, you know, from when I was there late eighties, early nineties. And uh, it just, it, and it, some of the change is really, really good. And I'm not one of those people that says, Oh, it's, it sucks now because of this. I mean, it's still a cool place, man. I don't care. You, you know, you'd have to do something really, really bad to Austin for to be a bad place it's a good place like like, like yeah. elon musk move here or something well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fine we you don't even that. Even, we, even guys like that they're welcome no no can't. i mean joe rogan just opened that new comedy club on on and the old ritz on sixth street and it is packed every single night and he's bringing like, in professional people what That's good what? for everybody what are the what are people going to complain about if there's not an Elon Musk around to complain about? Or, or, well, Joe Rogan, I think, is the next. And then I think, and then we'll, and then because it's Austin, we'll eventually get back around to Greg Abbott and Kim Paxton. Well, I mean, it, and you know what? That that's those are all good targets, right? And and Austin is plus. I mean, hell, I was a punching bag for a good while and for good reason, right? Uh, so I mean, I I'm I'm uh, sympathetic to that, but I also think that everybody in that sphere needs to get a little tougher skin some days. Cause... Man, I was going to ask you about that. Um, well, one thing I want to ask you about, uh, you know, when you were in the legislature, man, you were, you were my, uh, like a hero of mine. You brought the fight to the Texas Republicans. You were loud and outspoken and you didn't put up with any shit. And I remember I, uh, you, you hooked me up with an interview with your office at one point. I think I totally botched it. I'm sure I wouldn't no. know. I, you know what? I was thinking about that the other day. We should have hired you, Sam. But let me tell you the problem in the legislature. And it's like anything else is I would almost feel bad hiring people because we couldn't pay them much. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm almost like inviting them into this circle of poverty. With <laughs> I remember the, the first time I met you was at the state Democratic Convention. And you were looking for my boss, Jason Stanford, at the time. And you were so low key about it that I... Uh, but to be honest with you, I didn't realize you were who you were. <laughs> and then you gave me your card and I was like, oh, oh, shit. Oh, no, I, I'll call Jason yeah. right now. Like, well, yeah, absolutely. I'm so sorry. So I, I had uh, I, I did a little piece for Jason Substack maybe about two years ago. It was uh, great. Two and a half years ago. And so but before that, um, I think it was my penultimate session in Austin. It was during the interim. And I, I think I was on the Sunset Committee, and that's why I was in town. Is it was a really fun night. It was me, Jason, his wife, Stunia, uh, yeah, Chris Hayes, uh, and Erica Greeter, and we were at uh, the cloakroom, man, and it was a lot of fun. Man, that sounds like it. Oh man, that's, that's <laughs> what, a, what a fun crew, man. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, yeah. That, that's that's yeah, the I cool kid I, table right there. 
You know, it's funny is that that piece that I did for Jason, I, I had occasion to reread it because I was can asked, you, Hey, for folks that didn't read it, can you, can you kind of just uh, kind of break down what it was? Sure. What... So, uh, so the, the, the piece was, the piece came together because at the time I had 282, 282 or 83 days of sobriety. And I think my memory might not be right on in terms of days. It's 280 something days. Well, um, you, get, you get credit for that. We don't need to like, you're, in, you're there. So I, I, I wrote it from the perspective of Jason's question to me in sparking this was, there's a lot of people that are interested in how you're doing at that point. And you're, you know, going back to August, September of 2020. And so I think I'd been, you know, we we're in the middle of the pandemic and I think I had been post rehab, maybe I got out in March uh, No, I'm sorry, February of 2020. So I'd been out of rehab, maybe six months. And so I was adjusting to all that and adjusting to kind of, um, how much the world had slowed down. And to kind of bring you up to that point is, you know, for the last few years that I was in the legislature, I'd become a very bad alcoholic and a bad addict. You know, I'd become addicted to cocaine. And and it all kind of culminated in what I think people at the time believed had been the worst thing to happen to me, which is, you know, a couple, two or three grams of cocaine falling out of my pocket at the state FBO. And then a couple months later, you know, the, the story, by the time the story hit publicly, I was already dealing with it privately, you know, both the legal aspect and, you know, physically and all that stuff. And um, I think for a lot of people that don't understand the disease or don't know me, they they maybe rightfully believe that that was something very terrible. And maybe objectively so somebody could think about it. But the way I look at it today, you know, we're, um, you know, almost three and a half years removed from that. And I really look at it as one of the, it's weird, but it's one of the best days of my life because it saved my life. And it put me in a position today where, you know, I really enjoy all the parts of my life. And I don't mean like in some goofy way that I'm just running around with a big fucking smile on my face all the time, but I enjoy even the things that are hard today. And it's not that I, I wasn't conditioned to do that before, but you know, my whole life I'd been kind of like this fist pounding to get ahead and, uh, you know, being ultra competitive and being a type A personality in all these different situations. And then going to the legislature where, you know, you've got a lot of type A's and then you've got a lot of people masquerading as type A's and you're not sure who's who. And, you know, it, it can bring out the best and the worst in you. And some days it brought out the best in me and some days it brought out the worst. And so that, that piece that, that, Jason asked me to write was about how I was doing to that point. And I, when I reread it, I realized that I, I, you know, not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, but I think I, I, I did a good job of describing at least from my point of view and for me, how the legislature works, right. Uh, and how complex it can be, but yet how simple, you know, I, I've, I've been following all this stuff about the impeachment, you know, the last week or so. And I, I see like a lot of people trying to play this 88 dimensional chess about why people doing or this or voting this way. And I look at it and I laugh because I know one, I know a lot of these people. And two is I know that some things are simple. Sometimes they're not that complicated. And right. I think for me, uh, it became complicated for me because of my desire not to be a back backbencher. You know, you mentioned me being loud and I've always been kind of in front and, you know, I, I, I subscribe to the leadership of, uh, you know, before just being out in front, whereas now it's, you know, leadership might mean uh, accepting some things that I normally wouldn't accept and, you know, listening a little bit better and, and realizing when it's not my turn to bat, so to speak. And I wasn't very good at that for a long time. I, well, you know, say, I, I, I was wasn't in front. <clears throat> yeah. If I wasn't calling the plays then I wasn't interested, you know? Right. I mean, I mean, you were, you definitely had that, that, uh, you know, Dion streak, uh, prime time, right? Like lack of a better term over here. Uh, again, I didn't go to college. Uh, no, but I was talking to Tara about it earlier. We were talking about, you know, I don't know how many Republicans would have done what you did and, 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 uh, sought treatment and went off to work with yourself and not to make this partisan, but if that's not a testament to your character that you go like, holy shit, man, I got it. I've got it deal with this i can't i can't just keep 
you know, redlining it and and doing the charade and and all that. Well, I I I realized, and I'm glad that I was able to realize it uh, that it wasn't about you know what were people going to think or how how I was going to survive this either professionally, politically, personally. Um, it was about it was really life and death, and I I can't I I have enough empirical evidence and examples of how the disease and not dealing with it is life and death that I know I made the right decision that it didn't matter what grenades were going to go off I I had to I had to start being honest with myself about who I was and why I was the way I was and then starting to deconstruct all these things I've been you know I don't know if I'll ever get to the end of that but you know I've been working on it for the last you know three years seven months and however many days do you right? think uh uh do you think there was a, like uh you know you're a front man in a in a band uh uh and i'm so excited that you have just vague all you said was meetings in nashville that sounds so exciting uh but do you think there was a performative aspect at times in legislature for you i think so i mean i think for some of us and not all of us and i think uh there's no doubt that there's certain things that you're doing that you do to draw attention to yourself, to separate yourself from the pack. I mean, you see a lot of it now. Um, and I, I can't, you know, I can't tell you, I have a good idea what's performative and what's not just from some people that I know and what's sincere and what's not. Uh, I try not to comment on that too much other than when I see it's very ridiculous and maybe probably I should keep my mouth shut. But I, I think because I, I, I look around and I mean, I don't need to look very much further than my own hypocrisy, right? And I do that. And so I'm not, when somebody says, well, you know, you got defects. Well, yeah. And I'm not unwilling to talk about them, right? Like, right. These are, this is who I am. This is what I am. And this is how I am. And I, th I think that's, and, a, that's as real as you can be in this life is to be able to talk about your, your shortcomings, your downfall, you know, your defects and be able to be real about it. Right. And it, it didn't come, you know, it's funny is, Initially, you know, the, the human instinct to survive and maybe to deflect is strong, right? And especially for an addict, an alcoholic. I mean, that is that is survival mode for the disease, right? That's how the disease lives is by uh, deflecting, by, you know, dissembling, by denying, et cetera, et cetera. And so the big part of me starting to get better was the, the moment that I said, no, this is enough of that. And once that happened, things started to change. And, and initially it was hard. Like change is fucking hard, man. And it's not no, it's not so much hard because we resist it. I mean, it's not so hard because it's change. It's hard because we resist it. And um, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but once I started to let go of things, I started to get and gain more things back. And um, when you say let go, do you mean just like quit worrying about everything? Because I imagine in those yeah. legislative days, you're, I mean, I can't imagine. You're talking about you're you're drinking, uh, you're doing coke, you're 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 in a minority party of a very aggressive Republican party. And I imagine it was just I, I mean, it sounds like the last 20 minutes of Goodfellas. Yeah, except and I, I was probably seeing helicopters too, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think the I think that this desire, at least that I had to um to want to control all these things that frankly are out of control. I mean, being a member of a body like the Texas legislature, whether you realize it or not, you're seeding. If, if you're not understanding that you have to cede a lot of control then you're doing it wrong, because I, I think the members that I most admire that I served with that I could see them like ebbing and flowing between those two things of control and not having it. And they were doing it remarkably. When you say they, that you can name some of those folks. I mean, I, I could tell you that uh, I could tell you that Dennis Bonin is one of those guys. Yeah, uh, I can tell you that Terry Canales is one of those guys. Yeah, I can tell you that Trent Ashby is one of those guys. Uh, Chris Patty is one of those guys. Uh, Rafael Anchia is one of those guys. Yeah, that um, you know, and and it's not that they're not without their their uh, that that they're perfect at it. But I think they had a good handle on that. Uh, and I think I did too. But my problem was 
I really could not deal with the near misses. You know, in my mind, it's, and I, I should have been dealing with it the way I understand baseball to work. You know, in baseball, if you're three out of 10, you know, in softball, if you're three out of 10, you're in the Hall of Fame, man. Right. The game is built on failure, right? And that's why I enjoy it. And I didn't realize, hey, this game is built on failure too. You're going to fail a lot more than you're going to succeed, but it would just drive me fucking nuts. And really? uh, I should have been better at handling those swings and I just really couldn't. And, you know, as I was dealing with a lot of grief and that's really not an excuse in and of itself. It's just a fact. Right. I dealt with it, I dealt with it poorly because I used the grief as some sort of shield and sword because I couldn't accept all these other things, right? What do you think, uh, what was, what, like, what don't people realize about how, and if this is redundant from what you just said, I apologize, but what do you think people uh, in our state don't realize uh, that's, that's a, a, a huge challenge when you are in the Capitol and you are sit there by your constituents? I think I think it's balancing the three constituencies, and this is going back to what I wrote for Jason, you know, two years ago and change is there really is three constituencies. You know, there's the people that send you your constituency. There is the special interest groups that is also a constituency. And then there are your fellow legislators that are a constituency. And then how these, th how these three things work together and symbiotically or, or not, you know, cause they can clash uh, sometimes all three of them in different ways. That to me is the, the testament of how well you're going to do at it. Right how well you can balance those things because you're, you're, whether you want to admit this or not, you're serving those three constituencies. And it's, it's people don't know that if you're doing it at a high level and if you're doing it right, you're all in. And I could never accept just being somebody that was up there to eat a free steak and then sitting in the back and being quiet. You know, I, I couldn't do that. Well, and, I was, there was no mistake about that. And, and I, I, Maybe I would have been better off doing it, but like, you know, I've had this conversation with my wife. She just, she kind of pats me on the head and said, that ain't you. Like, you're not, you're not built that way. And I think because I couldn't pick my spots enough that it was frustrating me. But I, I really believe it was me not being able to juggle those three things that, that some of these men and women are very good at doing and I admire them for doing it. Right. Right. And I, and I, and that that admiration crosses party lines, whether I agree with their politics or that's not. That's what I that's what I was I was trying to get to is I'm sure, I'm sure uh, what people a lot of folks, especially in the current state of Texas politics, or even in the, uh, this country's politics right now, that you, folks don't realize that you know you like you're about to I don't want to cut you off, but that you you know there were guys that you 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 know go man he's doing it right who were on the other side of the aisle. Well, and I, and I, I, a lot of people wouldn't understand that. I mean, and I have, besides like grudging respect that for some of uh, my political opponents, there were some that I had very real and I have very real friendships and love for, right? And so, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop me from being frustrated at some of the shit they do or say, but it doesn't keep me from being their friends and loving them no matter what, you know? And so, um, and, I, and I think, even before I, I was, I wasn't surprised by some of the people that stood up for me and then, you know, behind closed doors and even, you know, publicly uh, rooted for me because I knew the, the content of their character, right? Uh, just like, I, you know, you're not surprised by the people that walk away. And in a way, things like this are good because it allows you to cull the herd, so to speak. Right. Figure out who's real in your life, right? And, and that's, those are good things. And I, I was, I was... I was gratified and I'm grateful that, you know, my, and I, maybe I'm naively faithful and trust uh, faithful to the idea that people are genuinely good and I'm never going to shake that. And it was reinforced by this experience. It's reinforced every day. You know, even when, even when people do shitty things, it's, you know, I, I almost got to laugh and say, well, they do shitty things because they don't know any better. Right. Right. And, um, and that's their deal. And now when you were like uh, a couple questions, one, were, were you wild in college at UT? You know what? I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I mean, I, I, Did you I studied for anything. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't do that. Uh, I didn't do that to law school. And uh, by then, it, by then, I was already a lot more seasoned. And I think I was a lot, um, a lot crazier in law school. Just really. To, uh, but I mean, I undergrad was. And I think part of it is, I mean, I grew up, you know, 
part-time in, in Mexico and part-time here. And so I, I was a little more sophisticated than a lot of the college freshmen because we were used to staying out late, you know, going to clubs and bars already. And so all that stuff wasn't new to me. Like I didn't go to college and get crazy. I, I was already, I was already on the same trip, so to speak. Right. right. And, and so it didn't seem like a big deal. And maybe that's why I was good at it because a lot of kids wash out because it's their first kind of taste of any real freedom and they don't know how to handle it. Like, like the small town kid who finally gets to go out and get crazy. Yeah. And so I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I, I, that's the way it worked for me. And, um, you know, I went through periods after I graduated law school where, and before I got married, where you know, I was really living on the edge and then I kind of pulled myself back. I got married and I started having kids. And, you know, by the time I got into the legislature, you get into this idea that, you're really bullet, bulletproof and i didn't realize like how bad my drinking had gotten really when i started experimenting with drugs again it was just like you know like wildfire uh, uh were you, were, were, was that happening at the capitol not in the capitol but it was happening during my around tenure. before you got there whatever yeah and so i think that uh i think that i was susceptible because I wasn't taking care of myself, like the person that I am. I was ignoring all these things about me that I shouldn't have been ignoring, right? And the symptom uh, of ignoring that and the consequences was me devolving into this alcoholic addict, right? Um, and I, I, I tell people, you know, as far as having a disease, it's, it's like being a diabetic, right? You know, I got to do things today to make sure that, you know, in a week, they're not cutting off fingers and toes or I'm not in a coma, right? Right. And you know, I, it's not my fault that I'm an alcoholic and an addict, but I'm responsible for all the shit that, that I've done and, and that I may do because of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how real you are about all this stuff at a time in which so few are able to be real about it. Uh, and I, and I respect the anonymity of the program because I, you know, I'm, I practice the program and the 12 steps but that was never really an option for me. And I really think that um, being secretive about it, um, not wanting to talk about it would have been detrimental to me getting better. I mean, I think, I think there's no doubt so, there was a kid who saw your story or uh, was dealing with stuff and, and, you know, you made it a lot easier for that kid to go to treatment or that kid to seek help. I, that, that's been a, that's been something that it's been a reoccurring theme. Like the more times that I'm able to talk about it to more people, there's always that one or two people that reach out or a family member. And, you know, I've, I've become more, um, more immersed in, in how the program works and all the 12 steps, including the 12 step, which is bringing the message to other people, you know, that want it, not necessarily that need it, but that want it. And, uh, and I think that that's, that helps me any any addict or alcoholic and i'm including myself there they feed off, off being able to help other people through their deals you know that's part of it's part of the program it's a big when you're when you're I, growing up you, absolutely uh when you're growing up did your folks drink not really and that's kind of the my, i'm not from a very big drinking family you know my, think, my mom never drank but my, my old man boy he was a trial attorney in austin and he I mean, he was old Clark Thomas lawyer, and oof. no, you know, my, by the time by the time I was a kid, my father had quit drinking and and smoking, and and so it it wasn't um, I wasn't really around that. And I think where are that, you in the birth order of your? Of I'm your... a middle child, and so middle child, middle children. I see my middle child; they really they really strive and and. Um, it's always, right. it's always the rock stars. It's always the rock stars. My middle well, they, brother's you... a drummer in about seven bands in Austin right now, and uh, and yeah, I well because you're you're trying to get heard amidst the the cacophony of your older sibling and the younger one who gets all the fucking attention, and yeah. you know, I just I don't know, and I see that with my middle child. I tell her like, hey, don't be in a hurry uh, to get noticed. Like your time will come. Right, just focus, just hunker down. Right, just focus but, on your, uh, your craft. I, I think that um, I think that today I'm in a lot better place than I was, you know, four years ago or five years ago when I was in the legislature. I I don't, and I miss I miss the people. I miss the good on good. I I don't miss uh, the ticky tacky bullshit. You know, nobody does, right? 
uh, and I don't miss, I, I laugh. I, I, I'm, I'm I always fuck with my compadre Terry because I'll send him a text because I'll see some somewhere where he's like, I spent the day at this factory and it's the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> I'll send him a text like, come on, man. But I mean, you know, he's, he's sincere about that. And it's, I guess it's real, but I, I don't miss any of that. You know, right. I, I, not that those things are bad. I just don't miss that. When, when did uh, you, did you, when did you decide, like, at what point are you practicing law that you're going, like, I think I could fucking run? Well, it's funny. is that the, It came out over a – the whole thing started because of Barbacoa, man. And uh, I think Barbacoa is a catalyst for a lot of stuff, right? It's delicious. It's nutritious. It's full of protein. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it's the genesis of a lot of good ideas, right? And so Sunday morning, me and and – my old friend and still friend, Obi Salinas. Obi had been doing some work for me in, in Arizona because I'm licensed to practice law out there. And, you know, he'd, he'd been involved in politics. He says, hey, uh, I've heard a rumor that the state representative, you know, you're, you've are you been redistricted and that the guy's going to run for Congress. And this so was like- was Pete, late, what it? Pete Gallego, yeah. This, this was late August of 2011. And in, so- he started checking off some boxes in terms of my bona fides locally, politically, et cetera, et cetera. And looking at the numbers, he says, man, I think you can run and win this seat. And I'd always kind of been interested in that. That's, we had talked about it before. And so that Sunday, I called a friend of mine, uh, Mark Rodriguez, who's a lobbyist in Austin. I've known Mark for you know 10 years before that. And Mark, Mark said, well, if that guy runs for Congress, it's an open seat and, you know, you got, you know, Pete is, the, this is what Mark said. Pete is the 800 pound gorilla in the district. And so I'll never forget, fast forward September 1st, which is my birthday. I, uh, I open up a copy of the San Antonio Express News, which used to deliver every day to my house here in Eagle Pass. And on the front page is P. Gallego running for Congress. And so I send Mark a text, the 800 pound gorilla is running for Congress. <laughs> and so that, that basically started my journey uh, towards the legislature, right? What uh, uh, what do you think? What was was there ever a moment? Because <clears throat> you were reelected a number of times. Uh, did you enjoy the campaign part of it? Because you seem like I, you I did. I did. You know, I I, uh, I really enjoyed. It's gonna sound stupid, but I really enjoyed how you know when I first started going out to these different and places that were far away from you know, my ranch in West Texas, you know, seven, eight hours away to campaign. I enjoyed how it went from two people to four people to eight people to 16 people. And by the time I was done, you know, I could walk into a football stadium on a Friday night in, you know, I ran Texas and people knew who I was. Right. And it's a testament to how, not necessarily me, but how good people are at uh, communicating out in some places that you you would think it'd be very difficult. And it was a testament to how hard we had worked at being out there and being present. And I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you're, you're an uh, incredibly gregarious, charming guy. And per I mean, not that you're not on, on zoom like this, but I mean, you, you are, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, you seem like it was like the campaigning part was the, was the least of the challenges when you're, you're genuine, when you talk to people, you know, it was what was challenging about that for me was being away from home the way I was. And were your kids little? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, we're talking about shit twelve years ago, right? And so uh, things were a lot different at home in terms of how uh, old the kids were, and and the other was this constant having to watch my back now in a way that before I was a candidate I wasn't meaning you know, all these little movements and, and campaigning in of itself is very dehumanizing. If you're not being sincere, you know, I watch Ron, depending on what day it is, DeSantis or DeSantis, I'm not sure. The sanctimonious. I, I don't, I don't know how he's rolling today. It could be D or day. I'm not sure, but it's I watch right. him, I watch him and I'm not, you know, I, I don't necessarily appreciate the guy or agree with him, but I try to watch him clinically and, and academically and what I see is somebody who is not very com. Whoever it is, he is. He's not very comfortable with that. He's not that when he goes out to meet folks. 
Yeah, and I don't know what I don't know how you fix that. And um, I don't. People say, well, he's not being sincere. I think he is. And what the sincerity that we're seeing is that he's inadequate at uh, being Thank able you. to to shift. And that's sincere, meaning he's trying. I can see it. And, and but the problem with that is that it's it it leaves more questions than it answers about what and who you are. Right. So, I saw a clip of him. I saw a clip of him the other day where he walks into a diner and introduces himself to somebody. Hey, what's your name? And the guy's like, uh, uh, Jerry. And he goes, okay. Yeah. It's, it's kind of an odd, it's very weird. odd rea- like instead of saying, well, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Ron, you know, that would have been my response. Hey, Jerry, I'm Poncho. You know? right. I mean, it, it was just, it was so weird. He goes, okay. <laughs> and just like turns. And I, you know, and so th- those things, unfortunately for him is, and if you think about it, Trump is the same kind of, doofy you know trying to be what everybody like is it that thing i mean are you i think you what you're talking about that thing where they're trying to be what they think other people want them to be yeah trump is the same kind of inadequate uh you know tone deaf person that that ron DeSantis is the difference is is that none of that shit pains trump like it does, does that make sense? Like it's yeah, not he care. He doesn't, he's he's only and then his 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 filter, it doesn't matter whether the shit came off cool or not, because there's gonna be somebody to tell him, don't worry, it was cool, and that's good enough for him, right? Even though he looked like a complete tool. I mean, I mean, last night I I made the mistake, Tara was was uh, giving me an earful for watching his speech last night, and he's gone with like the new color scheme is all gray and black and drab, and it looks like the Snyder cut of Justice League. And uh, and he and he's going, he's dropping Elton John, good friend of mine, Elton Johnson, never do an encore. You do one encore, it's never good. You do a second one, they want more. And you go like, what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> I love it. I mean, and I mean, I I uh, you know, I had this discussion. There's a friend of mine. He was so convinced a few months ago that people were done with Trump and DeSantis was just going to blow through this and it was a done deal. And I said, look, I, I don't think that guy has the stones to weather Trump's attacks and Trump's barely in second gear right now with the guy. And I know it seems like he's starting to bow up a little bit, but it ain't going to be. Oh, no, he's not. He's still, I mean, he's still trying to lace up his gloves. And I, I, uh, this ain't his time. I'm not saying he can't ever be president. I just don't think this permutation of him is going to be president. And that's, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of a sad comment. If you think about it is that you have to reinvent yourself to become the president. It's either you are, or you're not right. Which I think is, which I think uh, is always been the refreshing thing about Joe Biden. I mean, my whole life when I've seen him on TV as a kid, whether he's sitting there next to Ted Kennedy in the judicial committee or whether he was next to Obama, you go like, he can do it. I think he can do and, it. And, and he's the same, and he's essentially the same guy, right? That gets off the train from Delaware every day. And uh, he's not, he's not any less goofy. Or but the thing about him, as opposed to DeSantis or a Trump, is you could sit around and bullshit with a Biden the way you can't with these other two guys because they're not interested in any of that. Like they're not. Um, they just don't operate that way. They don't, they're not guys just out to like, hey, let's enjoy the lunch. Let's enjoy our ice cream. <laughs> what was the I mean, chore? I, I mean, I, I met I, Joe Biden. I met Joe Biden uh in 08 working in Cincinnati uh on the Obama campaign. And and I, I uh, shook his hand and he and he goes, uh, you know, introduced myself. Where are you from? Austin, Texas, sir. He goes, well, What on earth are you doing in Ohio? I go, I'm trying to get you a promotion. He goes, well, get out of here. Get back to work. And it was just like the most, like, as Joe Biden, as advertised as it could be. I mean, I, I I don't drink, but I could sit there and watch Biden drink a beer and I can eat an ice cream cone or something. I mean, I that don't think that's, right. you know, that's what they say about Joe is he never drank. He was too old for pot when it came around. And his sister claims that, like, he was the guy doing wild stuff at parties when everybody would be like, geez, how much did he drink? And they're like, oh, no, he he's just Joe. <laughs> yeah, 
No, but I, I, you know, looking at this, like the, like, you know, we're talking about Paxton and the impeachment early. And yeah, I want to know your take on the legality of it all with the Paxton. Well, I, I, think it's, tried, I think you tried to warn us. If anybody tried to warn us about Kim Paxton, it was you. Well, you know, I, I, I think that all this noise about the process is noise is, remember, the job of the House, and again, it was undertaken, and it, it was real simple for those that aren't following it. Ken Paxton asked for $3.3 million to fund a settlement for behavior that publicly claims he did not do at all, yet he needs $3.3 bucks to put that fire out. So there's a very legitimate question from appropriators in the House. Give us some more details about this. And he refused to do it. Well, I mean, what so, legal justification does he have uh, just to just to say, like, hey, guys, can I borrow that money? Can you guys cover my tab? And, and I mean, he can ask, but but when he asks, it's OK for the House to say, sure, let, let me see the it's like that scene in uh Seinfeld, remember when Elaine expenses out some hat or some From shit? Mr. Pim, and, yeah. Well, yeah, what does he say? Like, I'm gonna need to see that hat. Yeah. I'm gonna I mean, Elaine, so, I'm going to need to see the receipts. See the hat, yeah. So, so it, it's there's nothing wrong with him asking and him settling the case, but there's something inherently wrong with him not telling the house why and then publicly saying all this is bullshit. Well, if it's bullshit, why are you asking us for three point three million? Well, what I don't, what I don't get is, was I, I, obviously, I didn't go to law school, uh, but how he could even go and ask for the house for that money if it was a personal suit? Well, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, he's the they sued the the state and the attorney general's office and the attorney general in his official capacity. So, I don't think that that's. There's nothing improper about that. You mean the, I think, do you mean, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, do you mean the indicted attorney general? Yes, the indicted okay. attorney general. Okay. Why was that so, not enough, Poncho? Well, because I, I think it's proper for him to ask, but I think it's also proper for the House to say, what, what, are we, what are we talking about here? And when he refused to do that, it also became proper for the House to launch its own in, in investigation, because if you won't tell us, and we're going to, we're at, you're yeah, asking we us to figure make out this decision, we got to find out. Yeah. And so what they came to find out were a lot of things that we had already read about in the media that now have a lot more underpinning to them based on, you know, this phalanx of investigators and, and reputable lawyers that put these witnesses through the mill, right? And asked these questions, presented this in a public forum, you know, to the GI committee. And then remember the GI committee in the house is like going before a grand jury saying, look, this is the evidence we have. We believe that he's there's enough evidence here to demonstrate that he's committed these offenses. And so we're asking you to hold him over so that the Senate can try him. And that's what the House did. And so listening to some of my uh, former colleagues and some people that I didn't serve with, denying that because of the process to me was um, shameful. It, it was odd. You know, for some of them, it was shameful. And for some of them, it was odd because I wasn't I don't think they were they were following the process or, is it, is or it, believing do you, do maybe, you say that because do you say that because you knew them and served with them and you go like that's a weird take for them to have yeah and i mean I, I i can tell you that maybe from a couple of them it comes from a place of good faith based on some sort of idea of fairness or justice they may have but i also believe that it's wrong i mean and i'm just i'm just going to tell you that if that's what they believed i believe that's wrong because the process was served um, admirably by the committee, in my opinion. Um, th this whole thing that the attorney general didn't get a chance to go before the committee, it's horseshit because they had already asked him before to, to participate in the appropriations process, and he refused, and for good reason. You know, and he really needed the money to shut down that investigation because they were about to get into some serious discovery on the un underpinnings, right? And... And that's 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 where this trial in the Senate is heading is Texas is about to get a real earful on these things that we have only read about in newspapers uh, superficially. And I think what we're going to find is that he went out of his way to help his his friend and benefactor to um, to avoid, you know, an FBI prosecution. Uh, you know, he he the. Attorney's General's office, one of their missions specifically is to support charities in the state of Texas. 
Well, he took a position diametrically opposed to a charity in order to help his friend. You know, I think we're going to find that um, he uh, he abused that to set up a mistress with a job. Uh, and these are some of the, I think we're going to find out some more things, but I think between the house managers that are all extremely talented, in my opinion, and competent, and then the two lead prosecutors, which is Rusty Harden and uh, Dick DeGuerin, the the prosecution of this impeachment trial is going to go uh, very smoothly and it's going to be well laid out. It's going to be hard for the Senate. I'm not saying they, they couldn't or wouldn't acquit him, but it's going to be real hard for them to do so based on what I believe the evidence is going to show and what these people are going to be able to do. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's such a crazy situation. My question has always been, why did it take so long with all of his past legal issues? I, I have to believe that there's something going on that now makes him a liability when he wasn't shielded from this by leadership all the way around or by the house itself. Uh, and I, I and it could be, look, it could be this simple is people just got tired. I'm tired yeah. of being tired. It could right. be that simple. Just over that it. We've had enough. Done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it may not be, there may not be another motive past that. Uh, you know, I don't know if the Senate convicts him. I don't. I just know that they're going to, they're going to be in a very tough position to acquit him based on what I believe the evidence is going to be in right. the trial. And any anybody that, that keeps arguing that the process is flawed, well, we're going to see in the Senate, once the evidence is laid out, whether or not that process, now you're going to be able to look back and say, did the House, did the House act appropriately? And if you if you're a good faith actor and you see that, then you should have no reason to look back and right. say, you know what, this was the right decision. Well, it's not, I mean, holding on to him doesn't help the Texas Republican Party. I mean, look, there's a lot more. If the whole business here is about, you know, and I caught um, Governor Abbott's statement about, you know, the interim appointee. One of the first things they point out is he's lockstep with me and suing Obama and now Biden, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if that's the whole point of that, there's plenty of people that'll do that without all this baggage that, you know, they don't come to work with, you know, all this corruption hanging or dishonesty around them, and they can do those things. So why do you need this guy? Right. And the answer to that is you don't. And I would argue to any of these people that the the quote unquote grassroots that are angry is be better, be better. If if what you want to do is sue the federal government and you know Make an ass out of whatever it is you want to do, whatever you there are there are smart, competent, um, cleaner record. Trans, more transparent people that can do that for you. You don't need this guy, and you know. But but here we are, right? I'm still I'm still stuck on the fact that anybody was having an affair with him. I mean, <laughs> he he looks like he looks like uh, the crony in the opening of a James Bond movie that gets thrown off a train. But he always comes back, right? No, yeah. He's by the end of the movie. You're like, whoa, that guy's back. <laughs> and you know the, the guy the guy has been able to walk through the raindrops. He may be able to survive this. I don't know. Um, but anybody that says that, yes, things can be politically motivated, but if you're not keeping your nose clean fitter, figuratively, and in my case, literally, well, then they can come after you, right? I mean. It's just fair. It's, That's just the rule of law, right? Like, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And I, I can't, you know, um, I, I I've been asked several different times, you know, in my case, well, you could have survived it. And I remember my dad telling me, he's like, you know, you, you probably could have won re-election. And I said, yeah, but I don't think I would have gotten better because I would have just been dealing with, you know, having right. to convince. And, and would you, would you be dead now and had died in office? I think so, because I would have had to be, I would have had to be denying that and, or trying to convince people to trust me because remember, you know, in, in addiction and alcoholism, First thing that gets blown away is trust, right? And it's the hardest thing to get back. And so when I was telling you before that being a candidate is dehumanizing, it's dehumanizing because you're trying to get people to trust you, to right. vote for you, right? And and that's a big deal, right? And I, I took that very seriously, right? People uh, putting their faith in me. And 
I'd have to talk to people about my circumstances, not because I want to share so that somebody might hear and get better, but because I need to convince them to trust me to vote for me. And I don't want to do that. Right. I don't need that. I, I you know, I, I, I'm still human and I need some ad, a, affirmation and some pats on the back, but I prefer to get that because of my music or, you know, because my kid did good on the field or in the classroom mm. or just because I want to do it myself. Right. right absolutely. Which is a <laughs> tough thing to do. Sometimes. So, well, but, but the point is, is that that's that part of me doesn't want to do that. You know, we we're talking earlier about campaigning is that part of the campaigning part of having to talk to people to convince them to trust me is beyond me now. I, I, I don't, I don't have that in me. Because it just seems so frivolous, right? Is that what you say? Like, like not me, frivolous. and it's not. I don't think it's frivolous for people that are serious about being in office and want to stay there. But for me, it is at this point in my life. And I, I, I it just I seems would, like it just seems like towards the end it was so fucking frantic. And so, I and I and I frantic, frazzled. I mean, that's all those words fit, right? Because man, look, right, like when I when I got done in my last session, you know, I was still a few months away from all this happening. But I was convinced that I wasn't coming back. I was just like, I'd had it. You know, I had uh, I had a very terrible last three weeks, even though it seemed like I was doing all these good, good things. I just had a, uh, the things that I was really focused on were failing. And I just could not accept that. And I just basically said, fuck it. I've had it. Right. Can I say fuck it on the show? <laughs> we've, we've, we've done that many times already. It's fine. All right. So I, I said, look, I've, I've had it. And I, I, I really felt like I wasn't going to come back. And like, do you mean, do you mean not, not run for re-election? Do you mean yeah. I mean, I felt just... like this was, I was done. And then as the summer wore on, I was talking myself out of that shit and, and, and um, going back and forth. And that's but I just, from like the ego and the life, right? Like, and, and it, it just, you know, that part of me, that sick part of me that said, you know, you're gonna, you'll be fine. Like, and I was trying to, but I just couldn't. And by then I was so far gone that I didn't, I, I needed that to happen to pull me out. It's it's funny. And, that, I and that's to... what I think. Like it's so powerful what you said. And I've I've had moments in my life like that myself, where um, you know something that seems like the worst day of your life. You look back a few years later, or a couple years later, and you go like, "Fuck, that might have been the best day of my life." Well, you know it, and it sounds real cliche, but you know these things like you know this too shall pass. It's true. I mean it. it nothing lasts man not good not bad and and i don't i'm not trying to sit around being some zen daddy about all these things it just right is. uh but I, I think going back to this paxton thing what i think is fascinating about it is that the the how these different so i i can imagine that and if it were me i can imagine them doing a workup on each and every senator because that's your jury right you know when i try cases to a jury you know, we're looking at each individual juror and who they are, their background. Barcho, please. I played a prosecutor on HBO. I'm, I I'm understand. Like, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I'm, 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 I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. We're, we're, so we're, you the, know. Worst, we're the worst prosecution team in history. We let that lady get off. <laughs> so you understand. So let, let's speak as one professional to another. Sam, how's that? Colleague to colleague. I always just, I always just had water run out my nose. <laughs> so th that's that's I think going to be part of the the. So you're saying basically like they're they're making they're they're analyzing every senator who's going to vote on this. I think so. That that's how you're gonna that's how you're gonna that's how both sides are gonna work at this. What's gonna be their pitch? You know what is what is the which senator can't hit the curveball so to speak? Which one can? Um, and that's that's. I believe that the two between the managers and the two prosecuting attorneys, they're going to do, they're going to do a very, very good job. Just what I've already seen from the house is the, how concise, how methodical and how notice it. Like notice this, this is not one person dissenting in that chamber could dissent about the actual content. They, they, they wanted to poke around these fringes on how you got it. And why you did this and that, but the content itself. And so fast forward to the Senate, the trial is going to be all about the content. And so how in the, I want to see how the defense for the AG deals with the content because they got to deal with it now. Remember, 
Paxton hasn't been called to account to deal with it in any forum other than publicly and publicly, he just denies it or deflects it or Hunter Biden's laptop or, you know, federal overreach or the leftist or the wokeness. Right. It's never about what things are. Right. And so that you ain't going to be able to do that in the Senate chamber. That's not going to cut it. Yeah. You got to do better than that because the senators that want to acquit, they're going to act, they, they're going to plead, you know, privately to themselves, please give me something to help acquit you. And what, you know yeah, what I mean? You got to give me something to work with. Help me help you. You know, little Cuba yeah. Good Jr. Help me help you. Little Jerry Maguire. I got I, right, right. Uh, show me the money, which that's the whole problem, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I got to say in 2014, uh, the Hayes County Democratic Party was insistent on me running for state rep against Jason Isaac. Uh, and, and I immediately said, no, you guys have lost your mind. And I could have won that seat. I, I think I, I think I might have, but but after this discussion, I'm so glad I, I didn't go for it. You know what? It's the the legislature can be a very great place and a very terrible place all at the same time. It just depends, man. And I I it was a really great gig and it was a great opportunity for me. And was I, it an attitude shift between Perry and, and Abbott? Oh yeah, man. I mean it, you know, was it like showing up to school with a new principal? Yeah, it was like that. And I mean, you know what? Just I had I remember when I met Governor Perry, uh, he was with Kenny Armbrister, and Kenny Armbrister used to be a state senator from Victoria. Yeah. And when I was growing up, like you'd read about Kenny Armbrister and then you like Kenny Armbrister did they, like he was large, like uh, big he deal, was yeah. senator, but Kenny Armbrister was somebody. So when uh, I remember it was Charlie Guerin, he introduced me to Kenny Ar and Charlie probably doesn't remember this, but he introduced me to Kenny Armbrister. And then Governor Perry was kind of off to the side talking to somebody else. And so Garen was kind of trying to hustle me over to put me in front of the governor. But I was fixated on Kenny Armbrister. I'm like, wait a minute, Charlie, I got, I got Kenny Armbrister here. I can't let him go. And, uh, you know, fast forward my first session in the chamber, I get a note from the lobby from the pit. And what does that mean for the folks watching at home? Well, so outside the chamber, there's this lobby and we call it the pit because people hang people hang out there waiting for us to come out or sending messages in and out right uh, either staff members that can't get into the back or lobbyists or special interest groups anybody can hang out there and so i get a note and we used to play these pranks on each other saying hey somebody's here to see you go outside no is there so i get a note from gib lewis right gib lewis had been the speaker of the house and gib at the time, the one of my predecessors who had been a state rep in the 50s till about the early 70s wow. uh, had had passed away. And uh, I'm trying to remember his name, um, and I'll remember it at 11 o'clock tonight. But I went, to go <laughs> see, I went to go see him. He lived in uh, he lived in, in Pecos. I went to go see him at his office in Pecos. He was already in his 90s. And he wrote me a check, and then he told me a story about how his grandfather's elbow got shattered by a union musket ball. Wow. <laughs> That's how old he was, right? And Whoa. so Gib Lewis sends me uh, a letter about, or a note about meeting him outside. So I, I'm i like, man, Gib Lewis is looking for me. This is crazy. So I go outside and sure enough, it's Gib Lewis. So I'm it sitting is. there Stop. standing it's there. It's not a joke. To, yeah, so I'm standing there talking to Gib Lewis and he's asking me to do something. And I can't, I'm like, I can't believe this. Gib Lewis needs my help. Can you believe that? <laughs> that I mean, that had to that had to be so empowering, man. That had to be like make you. Well, it, it was it was. I kept a little note to show it to my dad because if I told my dad, my dad would believe like, why would Gib Lewis need you? Right, right. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't call you. Uh, okay. So we've done all the serious stuff. We've been doing this lately on this show. I want to hear from you, sir. First of all, drop the name of your band so people can find your stuff. What's well, the Red Floors, man? At the Red Floors, uh, and you can find it ponchonevadas.com, the Red Floors.com. Uh, you can buy our record on on Amazon. You can buy it at the website. Uh, you guys have shows coming up. Media. Uh, what's that? You guys have shows coming up. Uh, I don't right now. I've got actually, I do. I've got one coming up at Cooter's Pub. In a couple two weeks here in Eagle Pass, I play there every four months, and uh, 
I've hopefully get some more bookings, and that's one of the things I was doing uh, in Austin and Nashville. At, at some point, I would I would love to to open for you. And so we we uh, that would be great, man. A little double bill with Sam Slade and the Red Floors. I'm doing. I I'm got a big stand up. I'm doing an hour in New Braunfels uh, uh, again next next a week from today. I, I gotta catch your I gotta catch your act, man, because I know you're gonna bring the funny, dude. It's 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 stories. I haven't gotten politics yet, but I, I'm I'm fu- you know. You work on an hour for a long time, and then another hour creeps up on you in like two months, and you're like, maybe I just get lazy and do impressions. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but you know what? You you got so much good fodder in politics, man. Oh, I mean, I I mean, I was the guy that was that was what I wanted to do. I mean, well, I was raised on LBJ and JFK, and well, because I, I think people don't people we miss, and I miss the unintentional comedy of the place. It right. can become the unintentional comedy that can become in the hands of a magician like you can become intentional comedy. You know, well, what I mean? you know, the thing was to go to work, to lead, to come home from Chicago working for at the Obama headquarters and we'll go to work for Jason Stanford uh, who hired me almost based on your funny on Facebook. Uh, I mean, uh, he, Jason, he was like going to work for Don Draper on Mad Men. Jason understands like the, you know, what, what matters. He, he, matter. I mean, you, you two guys in my mind were the, like the biggest influences on me in Texas politics. You guys were the fucking coolest. Uh, uh, but yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably, uh, I'll probably phone it in and do a lot of impressions next Friday. <laughs> For <What's> an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Hey, that's a lot of work, dude. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you, oh, the thing we've been doing lately with all of our guests, uh, the f- five movies that when you look back, the five movies that had the biggest impact on you. Hmm. Uh, Good, bad, sad, empowering. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Andrew McCarthy gets it done every time. <laughs> the uh, the outsiders. Okay. Uh, You're, such cat an 80s kid. Hot tin. You're such an eighties. Yeah, kid. cat. Cat on a hot tin roof. Wow. Okay. Silver streak. You better get bad, Jack. Oh, I love oh, that's so crazy. Man. I'm sorry. That's so crazy. And uh, and Tropic Thunder, man. Dude, I don't know how Tropic Thunder got made. I don't know how they pulled that off. I don't I know. Mean, I and that there's different. You know, I like I like Weekend at Bernie's is because how I can't stop watching the damn thing. I just can't. But it, but but did it come out when you were at an age where it was? Like yeah, I mean, I I was fucking thing ever. I mean, it was even for like somebody as you know unsophisticated or immature as me. Like the shit was. I still found it to be stupid, but I enjoyed it, right? You know, it, it, it wasn't like some great production value, but it was just something inherently re- relatable about it. Like, you know, and I say relatable in the sense that this idea just kind of going with the flow and kind of seeing how things are going to work they, out. Were, hey, oh, were they lawyers? No, but they worked in some brokerage. It wasn't, room, right? They were like some fancy office, right? And I, I, I'd, I'd have to, you know, not, you would think maybe I have some, uh, you know, favorite, you know, musical movies or lawyer movies, and I do. But those movies to me are like, and The Outsiders because, you know, there was at the time I was reading a lot of S. E. Hinton's books, and then being able to watch the movie, you know, I, after that, we, I think I saw Rumblefish and um, with uh, Matt Dillon. I think he was in it. Yeah. Um, and then another one that had Emilio Estevez, um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but anyway, the outsiders was great, um, because it just had this real, it just felt really gritty, man. Like there was just something really gritty about it. I mean, everybody was in that movie. movie. and, And think about it. Like then there were a lot of big stars, but you know, who was the biggest star arguably in the movie. If you think about it, or actually two is. Leaf Garrett and Diane Lane. Wow. Like, think about it. Leaf Garrett was huge. I mean, huge. Like, Leaf Garrett in the late 70s, early 80s was Leaf. Was, was, he, a, was he a child star? 
Yeah, and so yeah, you had Rob Lowe in it and Emilio Estevez. Cruz, whatever these these new funky. Yeah, those all those dudes and Leaf Garrett, right? And and Daya Lane, forget it. I mean, she she kills I mean, everything. She, she's been she and she's like whatever Diane Lane was, you know, Cherry Valance in the movie, like that's her eternally, right? Like that's yeah. her. She hasn't really aged for me anyway. Uh, and then Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. I love that movie because Elizabeth Taylor in that, that movie, like find me a woman more um, more desperate in a good way, but more beautiful in that role, right? To And to be able to pull off this very uh thirsty needy yet extremely deaf smart strong woman in one role that is such a, newman, if you want to go back and watch it tonight it's a great movie and then paul newman like being a lush ex-football player who's you know rocking a six-pack like it's just kind of you know it doesn't it's kind of a weird deal but you know but it works man and then bro lives you know being bro lives I and mean, it's good stuff it's awesome stuff. So today, if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, modern times uh, uh, watch something just to zone out, what 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 do, you, what do you go to? You know, I I uh, I watch Parks and Rec, man. It's just just comfort, just comfort it's food. Just good. Like it it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like when you put it on, like you can follow it, and it's funny because it's 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 topical and funny moment to moment. So you don't need. Uh, and I've seen it's, it. It's almost like a sketch show. Yeah. So, but I I tend to read more these days. I don't. I, really. I, I've got books that you know. I read a lot of poetry, and I I um I've been reading a lot of um I'm reading this really interesting book right now about uh a football team comprised of Japanese young men that were in an internment camp. Wow, a true and, story. Uh, yeah, and so it's it's a true story about the internment process, you know, how it came to be, and then how these guys came together and formed a football team Wow! while they were in the internment camp. And so I, I just started reading it a couple of days ago, and it's fascinating about, you know, how it, the process of the internment and, you know, how fucked up it was, right? And, and when you look at it in the context of what's going on in this country where we're trying to move away from educating ourselves about these things, and it's like, man, this is something we need to talk about and we need to know about, and we need to be in touch with it because we should be embarrassed that it happened and we should be conscious of never letting it happen again. Right. And, and that's the way we do that is uh, there's nothing wrong with picking up a book and read even a book that you don't agree with. Right. Right. Um, well, I was, I was thinking about that today when we were, we were trading messages about getting this all set up. I was, I don't know what I, came on my little podcast app or whatever, but I was thinking to myself, like, I think I prefer to listen to stuff that I don't agree with. I mean, I, I, I that may I, be for always, but just like it gets me thinking about you know the counter argument and what you know. Well, and, I, and I, there's there's some things, and I have, and we have to distinguish, and I have to distinguish too. There's some things that are absolutely there's no middle ground on. Right, know, right is right and wrong is wrong. Right, but I also believe that I that there's certain situations or most situations, at least for me, is I I need to be more tolerant about why people are the way they are, but I just know that. We're never going to get anywhere if we insist on dumbing ourselves down and we insist on removing uh, from the public discourse and from education, the ability to 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 read different things. I mean, I, for me, like books, my whole life, you know, is uh, playing sports and reading books. And um, I I I grew up a lot by reading. You know, I I I was able and it, it was a gift that my parents gave me. Cause they're avid readers, you know, my, both my mom and my dad. And, uh, you know, to me that's, there's no better thing than picking up a book and reading it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in my house, we have a lot of books. And so I'm, um, it's, I have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to books. I can walk into just about any room. There's a book I can pick it up and start reading it. And, uh, you know, I, I gave my son, he's 12 an assignment. I'm supposed to read catcher and the rye in the next two weeks. And so to make sure he reads it, like I'm talking to him every day, like, What's Holden Caulfield doing today, right? What's he up to today? Who is phony today? <laughs> That's great, man. That's awesome. That is so great. Uh, I, I, next time you're in Austin, we got to get lunch, get get a, a, a bite together. 
Yeah, man. I, I look forward to seeing you, Sam. And I, I want to appreciate you and thank you for uh, allowing me on the podcast. And, you know, I know you're a weirdo at home and I'm a weirdo here in the office. So, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we're doing some weirdo, you know, I, I, I was speaking of weirdos. I was, I went to the smoothie King. We have a smoothie King here now. And so I was sitting there with my daughter and I said, you know, when I was in Austin, I lived like two blocks away from the smoothie King when I was a student and I never walked in there. And she's like, why? I said, cause it seemed to me only weirdos were drinking smoothies. Right. And she's like, well, you're in here drinking the smoothie. What does that make you? A weirdo, I guess. <laughs> uh, it works. And that, and that's the, that's the charm that this man brings to everything, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say, hey, uh, not to, to keep this love fest going on before we set up. Man, I, I've always, since it's the moment I met you uh, at that state convention and uh, and and got to know you and, and saw your work, man, I look up to you like a big brother. Uh, you don't give up. You don't back down. Uh, you keep it as real as it can fucking get. And uh, if, if more Texans had that attitude, especially men, uh, boy, who knows where we'd be. I appreciate that, Sam. And I mean, I, I um, you know, I ain't far from fucking perfect and I ain't trying to be that, but uh, just trying to do the best I can in my little corner of the world. And that's it. And I'm having a good time doing it. And that's all it has to be, man. And go, go check out. Find his dates, go see him. Hopefully I get to open for him. Maybe we're at Cooters. I'm not sure. We'll figure it out. Uh, I, I can't wait to see you, man. Uh, give me one second here. Uh, one quick plug. Uh, uh, series finale, Love and Death is on Max now. They, they fucked up the rebranding. And, uh, and uh, Pancho, how much do you love this? Max, and then the tag is your place for HBO. <laughs> what was what was wrong with it? What's wrong uh, with HBO, uh, man? And and next Friday, if you're watching this, uh, Friday, June 9th, I will be uh, doing an hour at Silver Spoon Theater in New Braunfels. Come out, we got a whole bunch of great comics hanging out, uh, doing time. Uh, I'm headlining. Uh, uh, next time we do it, we're gonna we're gonna drag this guy down there uh, to bring the whole band and everything. I I will. I'm gonna try to make it to one of your shows so that I can enjoy it and also heckle you. I want to see how good you are on your feet. Oh no, crowd work's my move. Don't don't even get ready for that. <laughs> I, I mean, come test me. Come test me. <laughs> I mean, can it, we'll find out if Sam Slade can hit the curve. That's oh, I mean, right. Out of the stadium into that bay. All right. Uh, hang on one second, yeah. though. Uh, this has been Weirdos at Home. I'm Sam Sayers, Pancho Navarez. Thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time.